Welcome. Today I'm going to talk about when outsiders believe that they are helping with their unsolicited advice and judgments when in fact they're probably harming. A recurring theme in the autistic community and I suppose the autism community. So when I say autistic, usually I'm referring to autistic adults, autistic parents, raising autistic children or non-autistic children. When I say autism community, I'm referring to non-autistic parents raising autistic children. The biggest issue, the biggest, hugest issue, barrier for families raising autistic children or for autistic people or for non-autistic parents raising autistic children is usually the same thing. Sometimes we think it's, you know, and it is, the systems that are set up to support us, such as school, um, social services, things like that. And they can be problematic because there is definitely a cultural mismatch and a very medical model understanding of neurodivergence. And that's a very real thing. So in the autistic community, there is a giant lack of trust for therapists, therapies, services, schools, and again, social services, because we can almost just predict that when we go into relationship with many of these systems, that they will have an ableist understanding of autism. They won't receive us as our own kind of normal. They won't receive autism as an identity and culture. It will be all about disorder and needing to be fixed and changed. Now that is not every single system. It's not every single practitioner or therapist, but it is a large portion of them. And there's been a lot of damage created. So today I wanna to talk about one of the most incredible barriers and damaging aspects of trying to reframe our lives as neurodivergent affirming family culture. It's our own families and friends. A lot of the time it's our own families and friends. Now one of the most recurring themes that I sit in space and talk to people about are those judgments and those opinions and those statements and those eye rolls and that unsolicited advice from extended family and friends who I suppose believe that it's well intentioned but sometimes there's it's a little snide sometimes it's our parents it's our grandparents and and I wanted to speak directly to that today I see this so often if you are a grandparent of an autistic child if you are the aunt or uncle or sibling or family member, guardian, teacher, just somebody connected closely with a family raising autistic children. If their lifestyle is incongruent with what you believe it should be, if their children are spending more time on screens than you believe they should be, if you believe their children should be in school and being at home is harming them, if you believe that they need more time out in the real world, because for some interesting reason, a lot of people think that once we step into our homes and shut the door, we're not in the real world anymore. I don't know where we are, but apparently it's not the real world. And I wanna say this with love and kindness and gentleness and with respect. It is not your business. It is none of your business. We are far more powerful and supportive and having such a greater impact to uplift our families who are raising autistic children by supporting them, by telling them the great things you see them doing, by speaking the beauty in 
their parenting by asking questions when you don't understand because there is nothing more defeating, deflating and harmful than somebody you love and trust and respect and many times look up to and go to for support coming back at you with criticism and judgment particularly when they haven't experienced what you are. So many autistic people are out here supporting families to live in alignment with neurodivergent identity and culture. And that can be extremely confronting to society. It flies in the face of so much of what we have been raised to believe, how we have been taught to parent, and what we have been conditioned socially and culturally to understand as being priority and important. Change is happening in the world and it must happen. When we look at the statistics alone on autistic folks and mental health barriers and challenges, on our compromised access to adequate care medically in the health system, when we look at suicidality, when we look at the mortality rate being significantly lower than our non-autistic peers, this means that there's something going on in our environment that is impacting our quality of life significantly. So when if you are a grandparent or a family member of somebody raising autistic children and they are changing their lifestyle in a way that you don't understand or relate to, I want to encourage you to take a pause and think for a moment how courageous that is, how absolutely courageous that is to be living in a society that does not support you and to be implementing these changes so that your children have a chance to do better, to be supported, to be accommodated and to thrive as autistic people. What this means is that that family that you are connected to, whether you're a teacher or a family member or a professional, that family has done their research that family has been in crisis. That family have, they've had to bear witness to their children suffering and struggling. They have had to suffer and struggle. And so much of that will be silent and internalized because it is not safe to speak our truth as autistic families. And the reasons for that is because people who think they know better People who think that we should behave, speak, think, live in alignment with neuronormativity, those are the people that create these systems to land on our doorstep, like child protective services when they're not necessary, like school truancy officers when they're not necessary, ABA therapy. All of those things do so much damage when families are exploring neurodivergent identity and culture and neuroaffirming lifestyle. There are certain ways of living in the world as non-autistic people do that, are, that risk the lives of autistic people. We have these beliefs and these generic models of thriving that are aligned with neuronormativity that are applied to everybody like a blanket statement. They're not even right for some neuronormative people or non-autistic people. When we say that, you know, if you have a mental illness, you must access community. You need to get out of the house. You need to continue to go to school. If you're anxious, you need to be supported to overcome that anxiety. That is not how it works for neurodivergent folks all of the time. We need less community sometimes because our neurobiology requires a lot of downtime. Otherwise we become completely overwhelmed and burn out and then we are incapacitated 
and completely disabled. We need to be supported to live in alignment with our needs according to neurodiversity, which means that everybody gets to choose how they live. What works for one person may not work for another. Brainwashing our children by educating them about their autism. Holy dooly. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, it all sounds very familiar. I mean, when you consider being neurodivergent as an identity and culture, so for me, autistic, ADHD, PDA, identity, if you can, if you take any other identity, if you compare it to being gay, as an example, it sounds so similar to when people knew that their children were gay. Their children would come and say, I, I want to share with you that I'm gay and the solutions that families would be given was to just ignore that and just to continue to raise your children as though they weren't who they've told you they are. We could take any identity and then apply the same principles, just ignore that, let's pretend they're not who they are inherently, neurobiologically, and just force them to go out into the world completely unprepared because that's that's effectively what happens to our children when when they don't know who they are when we don't know who we are when we don't know we're raising autistic children we're sending them out into the world completely unprepared we're sending them out into the world telling them that they're just like everybody else and they're not we're not and to think that there is so much power in having somebody that you love and respect support you in ways that are curious, open-minded, and willing to put everything aside that we think we know for a new experience. And I know that sometimes when we take our children out of school, sometimes when we decide that it is better for us for now to not attend so many family functions, people can take these things personally and center themselves in it. Sometimes it's very confronting for families to see that we are taking a step back. It's like, and it depends on the family situation. Sometimes it means people are losing their grasp on us, which is a good thing, but it's not for them. Sometimes it means that people are afraid they're going to lose us completely. This is why it's so important to have a loving, open, ongoing dialogue about our families. But when we are constantly judged and criticized and have other people's experience projected onto us, we are less likely to share what's happening in our lives. And then communication becomes thwarted and there is family breakdown and we find ourselves completely isolated completely isolated and it shouldn't have to be that way. I see a lot of uh, families coming into autistic spaces and I do get a lot of private messages and emails from families asking me how can I, what strategies can I use to make my children go back to school or what strategies can I use to get my child out into the community more and I don't do that. I don't give strategies I don't you you would be hard-pressed to find autistic people autistic adults in advocacy or support roles doing that because we're trying to create a paradigm shift here where people can understand the whys and make choices from there that are right for the entire family and sometimes as parents we struggle so much with this because we have this idea in our head of how our lives are supposed to be because the, the media and society have perpetuated this myth that we need to have this family unit that looks like this, that our children should all be in extracurricular activities, going to school, achieving. And I used to buy into that narrative. I lived it. And then some of us come away from that and realize we've been robbed the joy of being. We've been robbed of the joy of being with our children and being truly connected with our children in their authentic expression. Yeah, you don't get autistic kids to do or be anything, but you don't get anyone to do or be anything. We are responsible for ourselves and we can guide our children 
and we can love them. But having the information about why is far more powerful than having a strategy that manipulates our children into doing stuff. If you are supporting a family who is raising neurodivergent children, please do the work. Please learn about neurodiversity. Please learn and accept that we are finding our feet. We are all finding our feet. And this is a process that takes time and it fluctuates. In neurodivergent families, there will be days where we thrive and there will be days where we survive. There will be moments where we thrive and moments where we survive. And when you're not getting sleep, when you are nurturing highly anxious little people, when you are just treading water, during the times where we're just treading water, the last thing that we need is for someone that we love, who is supposed to love us, on the other end of a phone or in our home, criticizing us. We need to be met with love and support. So what can we do instead? We can ask questions. Can you help me to understand about the need for screen time for regulation? Can you help me to understand about why it's important for the children to be at home learning instead of school? Because here's something else. Children who are traumatized or highly anxious or in survival mode with their threat response activated cannot have the part of their brain necessary for learning active while that other stuff is going on. So we have to choose. Are we going to have expectations of a child academically while their mental health and well-being is compromised? It's counterproductive. So we need to prioritize a person's mental health and well-being. In that same sense, when a parent of an autistic child is in survival mode and their threat response is activated and they're trying to juggle a million things at once and remember a million things at once, especially if you're neurodivergent, if they're not keeping up with the housework, if they're you know, going through internalized ableism, giving themselves a hard time, holding themselves responsibility for their disability, they don't have the ability to stop and make decisions while they're in survival mode and someone coming in and criticizing them or telling them how things should be or are you really going to let your child get away with that that is not helpful that is never ever 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 i don't care what anybody says it's never ever 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 going to be helpful to criticize anyone's parenting it gets my goat more than anything criticizing people's parenting not okay, never okay. It is disconnecting, it is disempowering. It chips away at the thread between a parent and child that is already so stretched and so fragile. And as outsiders, family members, teachers, whoever it is, they hold so much power. You hold so much power in being able to elevate these people to do good, to nurture their children and themselves. Because that ugly, messy period where we bring our children home from school, where our children are recovering from trauma, that is ugly and messy and scary. So if you're uncomfortable about how it looks, imagine what it's like for us living it. It is ugly and messy and scary. But there's this part of us that knows that what we're doing is right because we start to see glimpses, the changes in our children's mental health and well-being, and it's worth it. But we need to be supported through that ugly, messy, scary stage to be able to get to the other side. And that doesn't mean we don't revisit the ugly, messy, scary stage. It's up and down all the time because we're autistic folks. We have big feelings and big experiences. So please be kind, please be loving, please be supportive. If you don't understand, it doesn't matter. You don't have to understand somebody's experience to be kind and loving. You don't have to agree with someone to be kind and loving. You don't have to have all the information to be kind and loving. You've just got to be kind and loving. 
and mind your own business and move forward with your life, eyes off others and onto myself. And that is the end of my little ranty monologue thingy. Do you need to look for a diagnosis for one of your children if you don't see any mental health or other issues? I have one diagnosed and another in process, but my middle daughter I suspect is also autistic, but doesn't require the extra support her sisters do. That doesn't matter though. She's still autistic. I think whether we have a diagnosis or not is a very personal thing, but I would strongly encourage supporting them to know that they are autistic and what that means for them. It'll mean something different for everyone. But an autistic person who is supported, accommodated and at rest looks very different to the criteria. The criteria represents dysregulated, distressed, um, often traumatized autistic people, those behaviors. Imagine saying to a bunch of neurotypical families, you must cancel all the activities and stay at home. That's what's happening now. And people's mental health is failing. I'm in Melbourne, so are you Nelly. See how it feels to do that, something that doesn't suit you and see how it affects your mental health. Yes, lockdown. They can't do it. There are so many people who are not following lockdown rules. They're still partying and having get togethers and things like that outside the guidelines. They are unable to stop doing what they need to have their social needs met. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is gaslighting and abusive to parent blame. It's no different than the refrigerator mother theory. We don't do that. We just don't do that. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I hope that you have at least one person or one space or one book that you can immerse yourself in or a YouTube video or channel somewhere safe and neuro affirming for you. If you don't have any friends or family, you are so welcome on this page. And there are lots of YouTube channels, pages of other autistic advocates that will reaffirm your lifestyle and be supportive and kind and nurturing. You don't need to get um, approval from the outside world. You really don't. Have a wonderful day, everybody.